So it's 1.30, so we'd like to welcome you to the Teacher Preparation Program Update webinar. It might seem like we had a webinar with you just a couple weeks ago, because we did. <laughs> that webinar was when we explained a lot of the flexibilities related to the Commission's action from their April Commission meeting. And at that time, we knew things were in the works, but we were not able to speak about anything possibly coming in the future. But now, because Executive Order N66-20 has been released, we have additional information for you today that we're going to share with you. This is a pretty packed um, webinar. We've got two different times we'll stop for questions and answers. You do have the Q&A option available to you that you can enter a question in the Q&A. Um, I am Terry Clark. I'm the director of the Professional Services Division. And if we can go to the next slide, we'll have the rest of the team introduce themselves with Amy starting us off. Yeah, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. My name is Amy Rising. I'm the director of Performance Assessment Policy and Development for the Commission on Teacher Credentialing. And I'm joined by several colleagues. Erin, would you like to introduce yourself? Yeah, thank you, Amy. Hi, I'm Erin Sullivan. I'm an administrator in the Professional Services Division with Carrie. Great. Karen? Good afternoon. I'm Karen Sacramento, consultant in the Professional Services Division. And Poonam? Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Poonam Beatty, a consultant also with the Professional Services Division. Thank you. And Bob? Yes, uh, my name is Bob Locks, and I'm also a consultant at the Professional Services Division. Thank you, Bob. And I also want to um, mention that Angel has joined us. Angel, would you like to say good afternoon? Sure. Hello, everyone. Uh, Angel Lopez, and I'm from the Certification Division. Great. We're so happy you're with us. And then also Sarah Solari will be helping us with the Q&A today. Yes, thank you, Amy. Mm -hmm. So let's move on and take a look at our norms. Uh, as you all know, when we work with you online, uh, we need to follow a couple of norms to make sure that we all have access to the material and can be efficient in the time we get to spend with you. So we did mute your mic when you arrived to be with us today. And uh, if we have time, given that we do have lots of participation today, it's really exciting. We're up to 258 on the line so far uh, and in the webinar. Um, we might be able to ask you to speak directly. And if so, we'll let you know so that you can unmute your mic. Please use the Q&A feature for your questions. We love your questions. We're here to answer your questions, but we'd like you this time to put them in the Q&A and we will uh, go through them in our um, two opportunities that we will have to pause and answer questions. And if you could please keep your questions on topic, it's really helpful, helpful for us to cover questions that are related to the slides that we've just reviewed. Please don't multitask while you're here with us in the webinar. Give us all your attention and we'll give you all of our attention. And then finally, just honor the time for both participants and presenters uh, by moderating your participation. So thank you. And if you can see there at the bottom in the blue, webinar slides will be posted on the commission website, COVID actions. You can go to www.ctc.ca.gov to get these slides and all the information related to COVID and the executive order that we will be further discussing with you today. Next slide, turn it over to Erin. Yes, thank you. So good afternoon. Today we will be presenting information on the governor's executive order. We will be referring to that as EO throughout the slides. So when you see EO, that's executive order. Um, as it relates to teacher preparation, specifically multiple subjects, single subject and education specialist preliminary program completers or those who were on track to complete before the COVID restrictions were put in place um, and new teacher preparation program applicants. The first part of the webinar will offer guidance for preliminary and induction programs who will be working with preliminary completers. We will cover the information that you need to understand your roles and relationships with each other and with the candidates, including what questions you want to answer in order to determine um, candidate eligibility under the provisions of the EVO. Uh, um, we will cover the types of supports that need to be in place for the candidates, including how preliminary programs will use the ILP to inform induction programs of candidate needs with regard to any remaining preliminary program requirements that are being carried over. 
Uh, and we'll cover how teacher induction programs will be using the information on the ILPs to develop enhanced IDPs and uh, the supports the commission will have in place for both preliminary and induction programs. Uh, we will then break uh, for a Q&A session. We'll have a couple of them throughout the, uh, throughout the item, but we'll cover um, those items that I just mentioned and that are listed there in number one, and then we'll break for a Q&A session. So uh, as both Amy and Terry have mentioned, if you have any questions, please post them in that Q&A box. Uh, and, and we have staff that, that will go through those and we'll get to them during our Q&A breaks. So then we'll go over the uh, flexibilities in the EO for new program applicants. These include suspension of the CBEST and CSET exams for program entry. We will discuss what that means, where those requirements will now be met, and how this is different from the flexibilities that were previously offered by the commission via the PSBTW. And then of course, we will have a colleague, uh, Angel Lopez, from the Commission Certification Division, who will talk about which program, preliminary or induction, will be responsible for recommending these candidates for either the preliminary or the clear credential and how you'll be doing that. And then again, after that, we'll have another Q&A uh, at that section. Um, and, uh, and then we'll, we'll wrap it up from there. So as we go through the webinar today, we will uh, endeavor to identify at each slide who the applicable audience is, whether it's targeted for preliminary programs, induction programs, or in some cases, both programs. Uh, we've also tried to be clear about which candidate types we're focused on, interns, student teachers, all preliminary candidates, et cetera. So in this first slide, we're taking a look at sort of the, the types of um, documents that are available to folks. Um, we mentioned here the preliminary credential uh, for the EO and also the PSBTW. So let's just talk about that for a moment. So we kind of have three broad categories of candidates right now. Many candidates have been able to finish all of their requirements. Coursework, student teaching, whether that included the flexibilities the commission offered previously, the TPA, all of their exams, and those individuals are going to be recommended for the preliminary credential as you always would have done. We also have many candidates that have been able to finish all of their program requirements except maybe TPA or part of the TPA and or the RECA. It can be either or. Um, based on the executive order, these individuals will now be recommended for a preliminary credential with either the TPA or the RECA renewal code. And we will talk more about that a little bit later. And then we have that sort of third category, which was the first group of folks we talked to you about in, in May, um, which are candidates who have more than maybe just a piece of the TPA or the RECA to complete. They've got some other things, maybe some coursework, maybe some other types of, um, of uh, clinical practice. Those are the folks that you are going to be recommending for that PSBTW document. And we have some specific slides on both of those still throughout this presentation. And now I will turn it over to. Thanks, Erin. Thank you. For, for our preliminary programs, we want to provide clear guidance on when a candidate should be recommended for the preliminary credential based on the executive order versus when to recommend them for the program sponsor variable team term waiver PSVTW. You would recommend a candidate for the preliminary credential with a TPA and or RECA renewal code that Aaron just mentioned if they fall into one of the following three categories. One, they completed all programming credential requirements except for the TPA. Two, they completed all program and credential requirements. Oh, sorry. Yeah, thank you. Sorry, my fault. Okay, so we are on slide six. You should still be on six, Erin. Thank you. Yeah, my apologies. Okay, so as I was saying, you would recommend that your candidate for a preliminary credential with a TPA and or RECA renewal code if they fall into one of the following three categories. One, they completed all program and credential requirements with the exception of the TPA. 
Two, they completed all program and credential requirements with the exception of RICA. Or three, they completed all program and credential requirements except for the TPA and RICA. So if you have candidates that fall into one of those three categories, under the executive order, they are now to be recommended for the preliminary credential. You may have questions about the renewal code and when candidates would be uh, finishing the TPA and or RICA requirements and we will provide you with more information about um, this and subsequent slides. So we really, um, for whom you would recommend the PSVTW. These are candidates who after applying the flexibilities that the commission adopted in April, uh, they would still have more program requirements remaining. So we're going to take a closer look at what those requirements would look like. Next slide, please. Thank you. So if you have candidates um, that have more credential requirements, such as the ones we'll sit on the slide, perhaps they need to complete the CPR requirement, CSET, CBEST, that has program requirements remaining, such as it's listed on the slide. They still need to demonstrate knowledge of the TPEs. They still need to complete sufficient clinical practice and sufficient solo teaching, among other program requirements. And in particular, clinical practice is an area in which the Commission adopted flexibilities at its April meeting. So if you're looking for more specific information about these flexibilities, please continue looking at our uh, COVID-19 webpage as we're continuously updating this. And there is specific information regarding the actions the Commission uh, took to provide these flexibilities. And of course, programs still have the responsibility and authority to make decisions regarding candidate readiness and all credential and program requirements. And we believe that the commission adopted flexibilities in addition to the executive order uh, would now provide the opportunity for most candidates to be eligible for the preliminary credential uh, with that TPA and or RECA renewal code. And that the PSVTW candidates will be less common at this point. Next slide. And with that, I'd like to turn things over to Terry. Okay, so I'm gonna just go through this one more time because for the TPA renewal code for a preliminary candidate, they're gonna get the, T the preliminary credential. They have to meet all of these requirements. So they have to have been enrolled at some time during 2019-20. We're not saying they have to be enrolled in spring of 2020, but they have to have been enrolled sometime in 2019-2020. And they have to satisfy all of these criteria that were in the executive order. And the first one's not very hard as long as the candidate was placed. They had to be placed or employed in an LEA that was impacted by COVID, since almost everybody's been impacted. They have to be in the process of completing the TPA. They were unable to complete the TPA solely due to school closures. And they have already completed all other requirements. If that, those four situations are true for your candidate, the preliminary program then must recommend the candidate for a preliminary with the TPA renewal code. So if the candidate has nothing else to complete beyond the TPA, you must recommend them for the preliminary credential with the TPA renewal code. So in that area, there's a slight difference in that the governor has moved this TPA to a clear credential requirement for these candidates. Now the question is, when did this, this end? And we're going to address that on another slide that's coming up very quickly. So let's move to the next slide. For the RECA, for credential candidates who were unable to take the RECA between March 19th of 2020 and August 31st of 2020, the preliminary program must recommend the candidate for a preliminary credential with a RECA renewal code if the candidate has nothing else to complete. Now, you'll notice here, there's nothing about enrollment in the program. The candidate does not have to be enrolled in the program during this time frame. The criteria for this is that the candidate attempted to complete the RECA, but was unable. So the candidate may come to you and show you, this was when I registered, it was canceled. That person is therefore eligible then for the preliminary credential with a RECA renewal code. This clearly will go back a ways. This is not only this year's candidates. This does apply 
to candidates who were prior to the 2019-2020 the year. Next slide. Amy, I think this one is you. Yes, thank you, Terry. I was on mute. All right, so um, as a result of the executive order, as Terry pointed out, the TPA becomes a clear credential requirement. So they're moving it, the, the executive order moves it from the preliminary space to the clear credential space. The statutory requirement for identified candidates to pass, right, has been moved. It's valid though, let's remember the preliminary credential once awarded is valid for five years for the candidate. So that gives them five years, theoretically, to finish completing and having it scored and meeting the passing standard. Candidates need to have support when they engage with their teaching performance assessment. Teaching performance assessments are designed to be embedded inside of a program and candidates can receive support as they engage. And so as the candidate moves from the preliminary program into their induction program, that induction program team will help that candidate uh, complete the TPA and engage with them around that process. And then of course, once a candidate does complete and pass the TPA, then the induction program now would be the one recommending for the clear credential. So again, simply the, the requirement has just been moved to the preliminary space, uh, from the preliminary space into the induction um, experience and really into that five-year window that they have. Uh, and we'll continue to talk about induction as we go forward, um, but that is, essentially what has happened. The candidate now has more time to complete the teaching performance assessment. Next slide. So it seems like we're gonna beat this horse again, but we wanna make it very clear to all of you, any multiple or single subject candidate who was enrolled in 2019 and meets the criteria that I went over two slides ago, and completes their preparation during the 2019-20 academic year is eligible to have their TPA moved to be a clear credential requirement. There's been a lot of questions about how long is this good? And it's good as long as the candidate is completing the program during the 2019-20 academic year. Every institution has their own academic year. We know some institutions academic year goes from April through May, August through May, or September to June. Some academic years might go from October to the next September. Whatever your institution's academic year is, the candidate does have to complete the program and be recommended for the preliminary credential with the TPA renewal code during the 2019-20 academic year. Doesn't this mean there are gonna be candidates that are completing in fall of 20? Yes, there probably are going to be. We will get an extension to the executive order. We've already been told if an executive order needs to be extended for future candidates, come back to the governor and have that conversation. This executive order is for the completers in the 2019-20 academic year. Next slide, and I think that's Aaron. Hello, thank you. <laughs> so um, the requirement for the RECA examination uh, in the EO has now been moved from being a preliminary credential requirement for individuals seeking to earn a multiple subject or education specialist creden preliminary credential, and it's now been moved to the clear credential requirement. So a candidate who um, is recommended for a preliminary multiple subject or education specialist uh, credential with this RECA renewal code is going to now have five years to pass the RECA. They are also, of course, still going to be doing induction. So once this candidate passes both the RECA and completes induction, the induction program will be recommending this candidate for the clear credential. 
Okay, next slide. We're going to do one more slide and then we're going to take us out of the PowerPoint to show you a new document that you're going to be very happy to see, I think. Mm -hmm. To be really clear here about RECA, any multiple education specialist candidate who demonstrates to their preliminary program that he or she was unable to take the RECA and pass it between March and August and has completed all other requirements. Now, it, TPA, they can, they can have both renewal codes. So TPA is not another requirement that's a problem. But the RECA people have to have completed all requirements of the program and the credential. If that is the case, then they are eligible to have the RECA requirement moved to their clear credential. So we've been asked by a number of programs already. I have a candidate who finished 18 months ago. The only thing they have left is RECA. The executive order applies to them. Erin, let's go ahead and quit sharing your screen on this version and go ahead to the commission webpage. And everyone watch very carefully because we're going to demonstrate how to get to this part of the web page, which you're going to want to get to on your own. We're on the home page and you'll see Erin's going to move her cursor to the more information for the COVID, more information. And that now takes you to the COVID actions web page. It didn't used to take you to that web page, but we realized the web page you all need to get to is COVID actions. So we've changed that. Now Erin's going to scroll down. And there's a document that had been posted in May, but it was updated today. The multiple subject, single subject, and education specialist guidance document. Go ahead and click on that. At our last webinar, we were asked about a flowchart, and we said maybe. Well, the flowchart is done. You will need to download the document to get a really good view of it and to be able to really follow it, but there is a flowchart now. It fin got finished today. It has a lot of different possibilities because there's kind of five things of ways candidates can go through. This flow chart is the opening page to the guidance document that has six more pages that follow about how do we help these candidates get their credentials cleared. So this is a document we really expect and hope that you will go to today. You will download it. You will have a copy of it. And if you have any trouble reading it, check with staff because we have been over this document many times to try to make sure that it is accurate. <laughs> Thank you, Erin, so much for taking us to that page. Go ahead and get us back to the PowerPoint now, please. I just feel that there are people going to that page now and downloading that document. I am done with slide 13, so let's go ahead and go to slide 14. And this is where I make our big um, request. Remember, the commission standards, its program standards, its common standards, they require that all educator preparation programs that prepare educators have to collaborate with each other, with local education agencies that employ educators. We've always known that preliminary programs and induction programs need to communicate about their candidates who go from one program to the next, but now there's an even bigger reason to communicate, the enhanced IDP or individual development plan. That candidate takes their IDP from their preliminary program to their teacher induction program. And Karen Sacramento is gonna talk about the contents of that more soon. But what I wanted to say is that with the COVID-19 now, it's more essential than ever that this collaboration truly be authentic and be very strong. And I think a lot of us have learned that we can actually collaborate fairly well over a technology te um, platform like what we're doing today. So this is where I'm, I'm making the plea, please, Embrace this idea of communicating, communicate with the, your partner programs because it will help our candidates. Go ahead and move to slide 15 and I'm done. I'm turning it over to Karen Sacramento for a little bit. Thank you, good afternoon. So this very directly builds on what Terry was just saying. The enhanced IDP for PSVTW and preliminary EO credential holders. Both of these groups will come to induction with an enhanced IDP that will identify what still needs to be completed. The expectation and the need is that they bring that um, and that induction programs expect that and, and that this document is uh, bridges the path 
for the candidate from their preliminary program to induction. Under typical circumstances, the majority of these individuals would have likely completed their program and moved into induction. The, the difference is that their experience was interrupted or blocked in some way. So they will start induction, as we've said, with some additional requirements to complete. For the PSVTW holder, that is possibly the TPA and ARECA, but absolutely with other areas, with coursework or clinical practice areas to complete. And then for the preliminary EO credential holder, it is solely the TPA and or the RECA. And as was stated, these individuals will have, have a credential with the TPA and or RECA renewal code on it. I'm gonna go ahead and go to the next slide, 16, and, and talk a little bit more about that partnership effort for success. This slide speaks directly to the collaborative foundation of teacher support. The link document in here, um, Terry brought that to you, to you a bit earlier. It's been updated to reflect the governor's executive order and includes clear expectations for, for each of these groups and for induction programs and mentors to help understand the respective roles. So in providing support and guidance to candidates who have additional requirements, the preliminary program has responsibilities to recommend candidates for the appropriate credential type, as was talked about earlier in, in the webinar, based on their needs, and to provide to the candidate that clear enhanced IDP or IDP, um, uh, if, if they're, if they're a, a traditional preliminary credential holder. For the preliminary EO credential holder who, who has gotten that recommendation, once that candidate is recommended for the preliminary EO credential, the preliminary teacher, the preliminary preparation program does not have any additional requirements to continue working with that individual. We strongly suggest and support that um, it's appropriate for preliminary programs to be available to completers who hold a preliminary based on the executive order to provide them guidance though on questions they may have around the TPA or RECA. And then commission staff has multiple supports set up that we will review in a few slides to assist induction programs, to assist all programs and candidates. Candidates themselves have responsibilities to complete their necessary requirements within these support systems and with the guidance that will be provided to them. Employers continue to have responsibilities, including supporting teachers within the work setting and their enrollment and participation in induction and then induction programs have responsibilities, some of which are more unique to this time and that uh, we will review in the next few slides. So looking at slide 17, let's talk a little bit more about those candidates that will be coming into induction programs in the fall. Induction programs will see three different types of credential holders moving into induction. There'll be those preliminary credential holders. These are the traditional induction candidates of years past, but even they will have some differences based on these past few months. It is likely they have had less clinical practice than in past years due to the interruption of the spring semester. So again, that IDP bridge document will be especially important this year for them as well. In the past, we, we have, um, you know, it's been a challenge at times to, to, to get those and to use those, and we will certainly uh, um, support those coming forward and, and emphasize the importance of that, especially this year. So as you enroll candidates into induction, induction programs, it should be that expectation that they have it or get their IDP to inform their beginning ILP support needs. The second type is the preliminary credential holders with the EO designation. Again, as we said, these are candidates who have a preliminary credential but have one or two examination requirements to meet. And induction programs will support and recommend them for the clear at the conclusion of their induction experience. Induction programs uh, will work with mentors to support these candidates and certainly um, should avail themselves to the commission supports that, that we have put in place and will continue to put in place over the summer. 
it's not the expectation that induction program um, staff become experts in the TPA or RECA or, or certainly not hold testing courses or exam seminars, but rather provide support through collegial mentoring practices that induction has done so well over time. And again, the, use, use those additional commission resources to do so. The third group, PSBTW induction participants. Again, this is the new teacher who has some very final program requirements to complete that were interrupted, such as demonstration of the TPEs or clinical practice areas. These candidates must be affiliated with their preliminary program to finish those. The preliminary program will work with them and recommend for a preliminary credential when they complete all requirements. Yet because this candidate will also be employed as a new teacher, they will also receive induction-based mentoring support for their teaching assignment. But again, they will have additional requirements outside of induction to complete. This group is similar to those participants that have been in induction from out of state or out of country who have also had additional requirements to, to complete, but receive that job embedded support through induction. Slide 18. We know that support will need to be differentiated by type of candidate and the candidate's needs. And that as uh, an individualized program of support and mentoring, induction has been doing this for years to support new teachers. Most candidates entering induction will be the typical preliminary credential holder that induction programs have supported over the years and will continue to support through um, starting with that IDP to build the basis for the ILP support with considerations for those end of the 2019 20 year factors, as well as uh, fluidity for what the needs of the 2021 teaching year might bring. Certainly all programs, I um, mean, you know, I saw time after time induction programs very creatively working to support teachers uh, over the last few months. So that CSTP based ILP focuses on those needed areas as the roadmap we've always talked about that guides and supports candidates through induction. And if the, the school year changes based on COVID issues, that support will adjust as well. And as before, with, with this group, there is that need to maintain that just in time support and then those long range professional practice inquiry goals through the candidate's reflection, goal setting with, with mentor guidance and support. And much of the work that is done with these candidates, and again, that induction programs do so well over the years are transferable skills for working with the other two groups and are already a part of the induction leaders and, and mentors toolkits and expertise. So if we move to the next slide, we, we look at those two groups of specific candidates once again through, through an induction lens and, and think a little bit about tailoring the support for them by type of candidate and by the candidate's needs. So for the preliminary EO and PSBTW induction participants, there will be some specific areas of support to provide. The focus will be on that mentor-based support of induction that will start with that enhanced IDP they bring and with what is needed for their credential. That is the main focus area. The initial ILP then will focus on these needs for these participants. And as well, as you bring them into induction, will support them in their teaching setting and, and dovetail those two areas together. And as was mentioned, there are specific CTC supports in place for induction programs in working with these candidates. And those include informational webinars for induction related to the TPA that covers components of the TPA and how to provide appropriate support. CTC staff office hours are, are set up for mentors and induction program leaders CTC staff office hours for candidates needing to complete the TPA, and then uh, a number of resources um, 
around CTC online teaching and learning webinars uh, will also be available. So I'm going to turn it over now, I think, to Terry. Thank you, Karen, very much. This is a little bit of a side um, topic, but we've been asked it a number of times. This is for the credentialed teacher. They already hold a multiple or single or ed specialist. They, in fact, they already hold a clear credential. And they're in one of your programs seeking a preliminary of another, I often call these flavors. They're seeking an additional preliminary. And this work towards their additional preliminary was impacted by COVID. If the candidate still has the TPA or the RECA or other requirements to complete. So you're asking, you've been asking us, what do we do with this candidate? So if they only have RECA or TPA, they can be recommended for the preliminary with a RECA or TPA renewal code. If they have RECA and or TPA and some additional program requirements, recommend them for the PSVTW. The teacher will not need to complete a second induction program, but the teacher does need TPA support if they're being required still to complete a TPA. In this case, it would be likely someone who held a, holds an education specialist credential and is coming back to get a multiple or a single. When the, pre, when the preliminary credential with the RICO or TPA renewal code candidate completes those remaining requirements, because they already hold a clear credential in another type, they'll be able to apply directly for a clear credential. The reason you cannot recommend these people right now for a clear credential is that the governor postponed the TPA requirement or the RICA requirement to the clear credential. These candidates have not met that requirement yet. So even though they already hold a clear credential of one type, they cannot go directly to a clear at this point if they still have RICA and or TPA to complete. This is complex, and if you get stuck on this, contact us and we'll kind of walk you through this. We know this is a small number, but on the number of questions we had, there are definitely some people who have this issue. Let's go to the next slide, please. All right, this is me. So I think we've kind of um, mentioned this a little bit, um, but this is uh, focused in a very specific area. Communication is going to be as crucial as ever. Um, as we ask you to continue to really keep the lines of communication open with your candidates. You are the ones uh, who know what they've completed, what they have not completed, what they have left still to do. And so if a candidate contacts us, particularly with a program specific question, we're going to refer them back to the program. This is a practice that we have now. Um, but again, in particular, with all of these flexibilities right now, you are the ones who are going to know best what your candidates still need to do to complete, and you'll be the best ones to guide them. So if they contact us with a program-specific question, we're going to refer them back to you. Um, the exception, of course, will be during the Cal TPA office hours. Um, candidates We'll be able to ask them questions during those office hours and uh, and get uh, sorry get answers to those questions. Um, but as I said, in general, as always, um, we will direct candidates uh, to to please talk with their programs if they have questions. And now we will take some Q and A. Okay, so um, the first question that we have is. Um, regarding um, SB 57, so Angel, you might be able to help with this. For candidates recommending themselves through SB 57, can they also apply for the preliminary credential without RECA based on the executive order and then complete the RECA in their first year of induction? Partly, yes. So what they can do, so in general, the, the RECA um, flexibility based on the executive order is something that can be used for SB 57, also known as people um, qualifying by a private school experience. And so it, and it, there's always been a split with the private school, um, those who are applying to have less than six years of experience versus those who are applying to have more than six years of experience in the private school. If they have more than six years of experience, they typically would apply, apply directly to the commission with no involvement of a program. So for those people, they can take advantage of it, but what they're gonna have to do is they're gonna have to submit some kind of evidence to us showing that they were not able to take the RECA between the 319 to 831 dates that were previously mentioned. 
So typically what we would want to see is something like they had, a, they had an exam scheduled and it was canceled. We want to see evidence of that cancellation. Um, so for those that have less than six years of experience, though, they need to go through a commission approved program and then the requirements sort of becomes the same. They need to have been um, prevented from taking that RECA between those dates and they need to have every other requirement ready to go. And the reason I kind of went, you know, it's a little bit kind of like what that question says is if they do qualify um, based on the program looking at everything they submitted, they would get that document for five years, that preliminary is a five year document and they would have the RECA. So the only part of that question that I would have want to change is it doesn't give them a year, it gives them the five years to meet that requirement as they work towards the clear as well. Angel, could I pose a question here though? I don't think that the SB 57 candidate, I agree with you, they can take advantage of the RECA part of it. I don't believe they can do that for TPA because they're not actually in a program. That's correct. Yeah. So for SB 57 candidates, for the six, the six years of experience people, the RECA, yes. Mm -hmm. But not the, and as the three year people aren't held to the, in fact, neither SB 57s are held to the TPA. So it's only the RECA is the SB 57 question. Yes, absolutely. Excellent. Okay. I understand. Okay. Next question. Can the induction program choose if the candidate completes the ED TPA or the Cal TPA? I answered that somewhat in writing already and said, it's not a good idea. The candidate should be allowed to complete the TPA that they were taught about in their preliminary program because the candidate knows about the assessment. They know about the submission process. They know about the scoring processes. They know the rubrics. That being said, if a candidate is a number of years out from their program and they did not pass it and they would rather do, they did not pass the, the Ed TPA, for example, in 2015, and they would rather now work with their induction program through the Cal TPA, I don't think we can say they can't do it. They have to have programmatic support though. So there's a yes, but, or no, but is kind of the answer here. Amy, would you, do you have anything to add? You can add on this topic? Um, sure. It's a, a very interesting question. Um, I think it will be a very uh, low number of candidates that have yes. not already begun one or the other of the models, uh, either the Ed TPA or the Cal TPA coming into um, their induction program. We really think the vast majority will have uh, just part of their work perhaps to finish or they really got caught off. They may have to start over. It just depends. There's a lot of things that depend on this question. Uh, but I, I can't imagine a situation where an induction program would choose a TPA for candidates. Candidates will come to you with an IDP and on that IDP, they'll tell you which assessment they were engaged in. Now, yes. technically, if we played this out and said somebody had attempted a TPA, did not pass it, tried again, did not pass it, perhaps. But again, I, I just think it's going to be a very, very small number of candidates. And in that case, you may want to just get in touch with us directly to talk through that issue. I agree. It's a very, very small number. And I really think it's going to be highly likely to be people who have a TPA from a number of years ago. It's not people that are finishing right now somehow. It, I don't know. Right. And so, but you still have to be enrolled in 2019-2020. So good point. Uh, I just, that's why I think really that, again, it sounds like a very unique situation and uh, we're always happy to come alongside unique situations and talk them through with you so that we make sure we're not putting a candidate in a difficult position. So with that being said, we could probably go to the next question. So if candidates fail the TPA while induction, who will provide the support to these candidates? Induction. Okay, so for interns, we, we have a, a few questions around this, and so I think the one that best captures it is um, this one. Previously, we had a webinar that talked about intern candidates, and we had said that um, if the interns change employment, um, that they should go on to a um, PSVTW, and if they were to remain with their employer, they should just seek an extension. 
So are we now saying that anyone who needs, um, who just, who needs additional requirements due to COVID-19 should go on the PSVTW regardless of employment? What is the um, suggestion for interns? Everything we've talked about so far is neutral as to what type of candidate it is, whether it's a preliminary student teaching candidate, a preliminary teacher residency candidate, or a preliminary intern candidate. If a candidate only has the TPA and or the RECA, whether they're an intern or not, they're recommended for a preliminary credential with the appropriate renewal code. So that does change the intern guidance from previously. If your intern has additional things they need to do, then you have the decision about a PSVTW or an extension. If they're staying with their current employer, an extension. If they're going to a different employer and they also have programmatic clinical practice, TPE demonstration to complete, th then they would do either the extension or the PSVTW. Great. Okay. What is the guidance from the commission as to whether or not induction programs can require candidates to work on remaining requirements as their ILP goal instead of waiting the five years to complete? It, it, the commission can't require it, but it would be so wise. The further the candidate gets away from their RECA and their reading, school, their reading classes, the harder it is going to be to pass the RECA. So the further the candidate gets away from where they learned about the TPA model they're taking and the rubrics for that model, the harder it's going to be to pass the TPA. What we don't want to have happen is these candidates do induction, ignoring their remaining preliminary requirements, finish induction in two years, wait another year or two, and then... I can't pass the TPA or I can't pass the RECA. They're not going to have an option then because they're going to have used up most of their options. So it's really to the best purpose for the candidate that instead of working on any inquiry cycles specific to induction, those inquiry cycles that they work on early on in the induction program are complete your TPA. Karen, go ahead and help us help us out with a little more detail here. Well, I would just echo that. I think that um, it's, it's a very natural um, progression to, to move the, directly into the ILP. The candidate has been working in the TPEs, which are the CSTPs, for the past year uh, or so. And um, it it, I don't think it will be a, a huge leap to do this. I think it will be very natural for induction programs to, to figure out what, what the, to know what the candidates need areas are and then uh, create ILP goals around that and support the candidate. Um, in some ways, I think it's not gonna look a whole lot different than what induction programs have continued to do for, for candidates over the last number of years. But I, I concur that that what is most needed would be to pass those exams. And so whatever is most needed, just like when you have, again, an out-of-state or out-of-country individual, those areas, the, the, you know, the ILP and the CSTPs are malleable intentionally to fit around candidates' individualized needs. Okay. Well, we are close to the uh, 220 mark, and so we need to probably move on. So... Okay, hey, the important part of moving to the next part of this presentation is we are no longer talking about the 1920 program completers. That's, oh, that's my foreshadowing and let's go. Here we go. Terry? Yes. So like Terry just mentioned, we're gonna be focusing specifically on the applicants that are going to be enrolling in teach preparation programs for this upcoming year 2020-2021. So specifically, for our preliminary programs, the executive order suspends the CBUS and CSET requirements for entry into your program. So again, that's entry into your program. In other words, programs may not require passage of either assessment as an initial requirement. However, these candidates, these 2020, 2021 candidates, will need to pass uh, prior to you as a program recommending them for their preliminary credential. 
So we want to be very clear that these requirements, they're still in place, just not for program entry. And as noted in the first bullet point on your screen, uh, this is also uh, for individuals that are entering an intern program. They could be recommended for the intern credential without uh, the Unfortunately, for uh, mom, your, your, your video is dragging. Man. But of course, they would still need to complete the credential. Also, this impact. Okay. Am I frozen or is that better? You're unfrozen, I think, now. Okay. Okay, perfect. If issues continue on, please just let me know and I'll just mute my video for a little bit. No, Poonam, I, Poonam, you are going in and out. So if you could turn your video off. So, and CSAT for program entry also applies to, you want to the next slide, please? Okay, next slide, please. Okay, my apologies, I will mute my video for the time being, just so you can still hear my voice. Okay, so under the executive order, as noted in the first bullet point, the statutory requirement for candidates to have attempted CBEST prior to admission to the program and the program to use this data has been suspended. Again, candidates must meet the basic skills requirement before being recommended for the preliminary credential. This is specific to applicants who could not take the exam between March 19th of this year and August 31st of this year, who are entering your program for the 2020-2021 academic year. And you might be wondering what we mean by academic year. That is specifically defined by your program in terms of when your program is scheduled to begin for this upcoming academic year. Next slide, please. So again, for our preliminary programs, we want to be very clear here on how the executive order is distinct from the CBEST deferral that was approved by the commission back in April. The CBEST deferral gives an individual, the CBEST deferral gives an individual one full year in which to meet the basic skills requirement. There is documentation that is currently under the Q&A section of the Commission Action uh, due to COVID-19 webpage that Aaron screen shared with us earlier. Is that specific again to uh, the Commission Action in regards to the CBIS deferral? So now specifically in regards to the executive order, all applicants, not current candidates, Okay, again, all applicants, uh, regardless of prior attempts of the CVS, can enter your program for this upcoming academic year. And this also, again, includes intern programs. And in terms of prior attempts, these are um, applicants who may have attempted the CVEST and not passed, or those applicants who have not yet even attempted the CVEST. And as a reminder, the other approved programs of satisfying the basic skills requirement are still on the table. And now I'm going to be turning things over to Bob. Yes, and uh, this is really just a reinforcement of what Poonam had said uh, with the eligibility for CSET suspension. For applicants coming into your program this summer or fall, uh, the CSET requirement has been suspended. And that this is both for teacher uh, candidates going into um, student teaching programs. So they do not have to have completed subject matter before whole class instruction or solo teaching. And this also impacts interns. So they do not have to have subject matter prior to earning their intern credential. And as an additional point uh, with this executive order, an institution may not uh, require cease uh, subject matter as one of their specific requirements that's over and above what the commission or what the state requires. So you cannot override an executive order and also um, require that they have subject matter prior to uh, going into your program. Okay, 
And uh, next slide, please. Okay, so the subject matter cannot be uh, su subject matter now is, is suspended for both interns and student teaching programs uh, candidates to enter the program, but they still must satisfy, satisfy subject matter prior to earning their preliminary credentials. So um, you may might you may want to suggest to your candidates not to wait to the very end to get that subject matter, but something that they should um, get to as soon as as soon as it really opens the testing centers really open up. And again, this is just for candidates that who are not able to take these exams between the middle of March of this year and August 31, 2020. And they must have subject matter prior to being recommended for their preliminary credential. Bob, let me answer one question here before we even go to the Q&A sure. section. You don't tell the commission anything about these candidates. You note it in your local um, file for your candidate. We are not going to come and look to say, was this candidate enrolled by this date? This is for the people who need to do their student teaching and are entering the programs for the 2021 academic year. So this is not, you don't tell us when you apply this for a candidate. It is just the executive order and it allows them to start your program. Let's go ahead and go to Angel. I think we're gonna get some good information about the recommendation. Hello again. So the preliminary credential recommendations, of course, are all through CTC online, same with the interns um, as they should be. And we just have to make sure, please, when you're taking advantage of the executive order actions to choose the right renewal code. So it literally just TPA will be the acronym for the teacher performance session and RECA will also be the acronym. We try to keep it as, as kind of cut and dry as humanly possible. The link on the file there um, goes to a step-by-step -step, um, submission guidance document that we created. And the, for those of you who are already familiar with making recommendations through CTC Online, the step-by-step the -step does go a little quickly through the beginning steps and then really expands um, in the area about adding the renewal codes to sort of speed things up because you don't want to have a lot of that um, um, explanation on things that are already exactly the same and you've already been doing. So if anybody's listening to this though and you're sort of new to the system, I still recommend that you go onto the SIG and look at the full um, CTC online um, handbook that we have on there just to get used to the system and then just double check the renewal code section of what's at that link there. Uh, next slide please. So who actually makes the recommendations? So the slide does break things down pretty easily as far as who does the preliminary and the very term we're able on the clears. What you really just have to consider is that this isn't that much more complicated than what happened in the past. If in the past you are part of a program that would have made a recommendation for the preliminary, you're still gonna make those preliminary recommendations. If you were an induction program and you're used to making recommendations for the clear, you will still be making those recommendations for the clear. The only added, twist to this is that because of the options available, the, as we've already discussed and others have discussed, there just needs to be much more communication and a great relationship with the preparation program for those of you who are especially in induction to understand that when you make those recommendations that the individual has met all the renewal requirements. We sort of recommend that you really get away from just like, oh, everyone has a preliminary, so everyone just held for induction. That's not true. It never really was true. And now it's more so going to be complicated. So please look at those preliminary credentials and take a look and make sure you're um, only recommending them once they've met all of the renewal requirements. Angel, can I add another piece of information for the preliminary programs? For number two on here, the preliminary credential with either the TPA or the RECA renewal code, the issuance date for that document cannot be prior to March, May 29th of 2020. Because until the, gov the governor's executive order was posted on May 29th, 2020, this option did not exist. So we've already seen, I think, some institutions that have tried to do an online recommend, but you have to have the, the issuance date be 
after March, May 29th of 2020. Yes, thank you, Terry. Absolutely true. And for anybody who may be hearing that information and think like, oh no, I already submitted someone and I know that I did it before 529. Um, if you haven't received an email from our staff um, explaining that that can be done and that we need to modify the um, issuance date of the document that was already recommended, please go ahead and send us an email where we're trying to catch those and trying to get the word out about this 529 start date for the executive order actions. And I think that might be it for this part. For the next Q&A, I think. I think so, yes. Okay, so our first question is, we do not have a traditional school year. We have open enrollment. Is there a deadline to submit an application for the internship based on this EO? We have candidates applying for the internship all year long. Are we able to recommend them in March? of 2021 without the basic skills requirement and or CSET. Can we establish our own deadline? Oh, that's a tough one. And March of 2021 seems way too far out. This executive order, as we were working with it with the governor's office, we were looking at everything in the executive order being allowed through maybe the end of December because of COVID and it's unknown. And the executive order where there are dates end August 31st. So it's from March 20, March 19th, 2020 till August 31st for the RECA, the CBEST and the CSET. So the candidate has to have attempted the this assessment during those dates. And so we're really looking that the intern credential needs to be recommended for the term that comes pretty quickly after the August 31st deadline. I don't think it's going to, it's not going to be possible for this to be a person starting an internship in March of 2021. Remember, this executive order could get extended, could have extension dates identified, but at this point in time, that sounds way too far compared to when the executive order was dated. Okay, so with these specified dates of March 19th through August 31st, are you recommending that the teacher preparation programs require proof from applicants that they tried and failed to take exams during that period or for teacher preparation programs to try to distinguish them from applicants who could reasonably take them say in January? How would we know this? That question sounded to me like it somewhat commingled the completing, which is TPA and RECA, versus the applicant, which is CBEST and CSET. The dates for the applicant for CBEST and CSET are that they have to have a tried, they have to be able to show you that they attempted but were unable to take. So one way that they could show that they attempted the closest testing center, the only one within an hour of where they are, is one that's not yet opened. So they provide you evidence that says, this is my closest testing center. The others are all over such an amount of time away. This testing center is still not open, therefore I cannot take the test. That type of documentation. Or as Angel mentioned earlier, they had a reservation. They had um, April 24th, they were going to do the assessment. It was canceled having that type of documentation shows that they attempted it within those dates. Okay. Will induction programs be required to document completion of the TPA and or RECA via attachments when completing recommendations? That sounds like an angel question. Mm -hmm. It sure does. So it, I, you know, I saw that and I was mulling it over, um, because what the real answer is that the, the TPA results and the RECA results, they do get downloaded into our database. So we do have that evidence most of the time. Every now and then an issue happens with that, just like every now and then something happens with the CBEST scores coming in or the CSET scores coming in. So it is always a best practice to upload as an attachment documentation, probably from the program sponsor or the testing agency as necessary of showing that they have met those additional requirements beyond just the induction with the recommendation. So it's not required, but it is absolutely best. Okay. 
Okay, I have two questions that are for Amy. Can you briefly address requirements or conditions for teachers student teaching this fall using virtual learning environments to complete the TPA? So that is a great question. We have a lot of resources already available uh, for completing performance assessments in online settings. This information is provided for you at our website, um, which is um, the ctcexams.nesinc.com uh, website. So I, I highly recommend you go there to get started in thinking about this. And then uh, as the months go by here in the summer, as we get into the fall, we will be offering uh, online webinars for everyone who's getting up uh, and running with a TPA so that they can understand um, how to do that and offer that support. So watch for those webinars. They'll be coming your way and will be advertised uh, through the PSDE news and other ways. And we'll talk about some of those additional supports uh, in the last couple of slides as we move on. Um, so can they be done? Yes, it has to be synchronous teaching. And there's some details around that, but we will, um, all of that is posted for you and we will be here to help you understand that. You said you had two questions, Sarah. Yes, the second one is really more, um, we've had two questions about this. Scale is mentioned in the CTC documents. What role does it play in the TPAs, if any? So, Scale is the organization that created the Ed TPA. I'm I'm not sure what else uh, there is to say about that. They continue to oversee any programs in California that are using the Ed TPA, and um, uh, and if you have a follow up question, let us know about that. I just think they needed to know. Terry, that I think it's that. anyone with an Ed TPA program that institution is working with Scale. Okay, when we recommend a candidate for an intern credential and they have not passed the CSET, do we need to leave it blank for meeting subject matter um, SMC when it is time when it is for the examination? Question mark. Angel. Yes, go ahead and leave that blank. <laughs> and then, do we still need to request the CBES deferral? Is the next question. If this is for um, for someone entering a program, n no, because this executive order sort of covers the same as that deferral word of, so you can just go off like, I'm doing this based on the executive order um, abilities. All right. Can an, in can an incoming intern be eligible for the ECO pathway without having passed the CBEST and or CSET exam? Yes, but they have to have passed the APK to be eligible, and they cannot get the preliminary until they've passed CSET and CVEST for certain. Mm -hmm. And will interns still need to complete nine units of a credential program before they are eligible for an intern credential? That actually is not a commission requirement. That is how your local institution has decided to address the commission requirement. There is a pre-service requirement that the commission has. And the pre-service requirement is something Bob Locks can speak to, and, or you can email him about that. It addresses certain content that a candidate must know and understand before they're eligible for the intern credential. That requirement is still in place. And will there be CBEST or CSET renewal codes on the intern credential? No, um, and I believe that was actually touched on by Terry earlier. So since those, based on the executive order, those are moved to requirements um, for the next level document, the intern themselves, it won't have that. That goes back to what she said about um, the local program should make note of that in their um, files there at the program level. Okay. So um, another follow-up question. Did um, I apologize for asking confirmation slash clarification. Did Terry just state that in order for an applicant to be eligible for the CSET CBES deferral, they must show proof that they were unable to take the assessment? No, but go ahead. 
that is what the executive order is asking for. They must demonstrate they were unable to take the assessment. I'm not saying be super tight on that demonstration, but everyone just shouldn't run into you and say, I wasn't able. They should have something that shows that they attempted, they tried, they were not able. And just to be clear, students admitted to the credential to credential programs this fall do not need CBEST or subject matter and can proceed to student teaching without these as well. Just fall 20 admits they need to meet prior to credential recommendation. That sounds accurate. Okay, um, the rest of the questions as I've skimmed them were really answered um, through the presentation. So, um, Let's let Amy do the resource slides, and then if we have a little more time between now and three, we might take some oral questions even. Great. Great, thank you, Terry. So next slide. We just wanted to point out that these are the websites you need to visit uh, to get all of the up-to-date information. And as you saw when um, Aaron took us in to actually look at the guidance document, uh, there's a date there that says June 8th, 2020. So that's today. Things are changing quickly. We're trying to move as quickly as we can to change guidance when we can and make sure you're aware of all the flexibility. So we can't say this enough. Uh, do look at the date of when things are posted. Do please understand things are changing and we are moving as quickly as we can to make sure you have the most up-to-date information. And this is a website you would go to find that. Also, we have been offering a whole series of webinars over the last several months since uh, March. And we would like to invite you to check out our YouTube channel and um, see all of those resources that are there. We've done a whole series of online learning um, seminars and have lots of useful information that are for all, uh, you, all educators, all EPPs in California, not only for you and your faculty, but many of these are very useful for your candidates. So check that out. And where there's a, an explicit playlist for the Cal TPA, uh, there's also an Ed TPA one. Um, and as we move forward here into supporting induction programs, we'll be supporting induction programs across our performance assessments. So um, whether they're the commissions or their additional performance assessments like the Ed TPA, so just know we will have support. Next slide just shows you uh, if you are ready to go this afternoon and you have an extra hour or two and you happen to know that a lot of your candidates will come into you uh, and will need support with the Cal TPA. We already have on the PSD e-news recordings that were done in January, deep dives into cycle one and cycle two of the Cal TPA uh, going through the guidance documents that our um, candidates use and also looking at the rubrics uh, and talking about performance on those rubrics. So these are already available. They are for you uh, in the PSDE news and have actually been there since January. So again, if you're ready to get started, you can start here and know that we will be coming back with lots of additional supports. Um, as soon as we wrap up all of this executive order advice, we will be getting on with planning our summer and fall schedule for all of that support. I also wanna point out another important date that's at the top here, July 22nd. We are holding an implementation conference, which is faculty talking to other faculty about best practices and how to support candidates with performance assessments. So again, opening this up to uh, those who do use the Cal TPA, but also I think this could be very relevant for those of you engaged in the Ed TPA. The things we measure, the teaching performance expectations are the same across these two assessments. And of course, we're opening our arms up to induction and welcoming you in. So we hope you can join as well. Many of you know we're working on developing an education specialist teaching performance assessment. And so we're also encouraging ed specialist faculty and others to join us for this implementation conference. It will be online and there is no cost. So if you have time on July 22nd, we would love to have you join us for that as well. And I think that brings us to our last slide, Terry. Excellent. We have one person's hand up. I will unmute the person and give them time to speak. Remember, we're not going to talk about individual candidates at this point in time. We're going to try to talk about more general issues. Carrie, you've been unmuted. If you unmute yourself, you should be able to ask your question orally.
Carrie, I'm, I'm going to move to the next person. Nate, Carrie, we'll come back to you. Hey, Terry, thanks. Um, Jessica Oligay, Oligay asked a question at 2.24 p.m. And I, I just want to confirm it. Um, the executive order is saying that a program is required to advance a candidate to student teaching, even if they haven't passed CBEST or CSET. Mm. So, no. No. The executive order says a program has to accept a candidate into the program. It says nothing about they have to be advanced to student teaching. They can be advanced if the program believes they're ready. No program should put someone who's not ready to be student teaching in front of whole classes of students. Thank you. Carrie, can you unmute now? While we're waiting for Carrie to unmute, there's a question here. Will there be a Q&A section on the people who were not enrolled during the 2019-20 year and need to pass the TPA and or the RECA, would they be on a PSVTW? That's a tricky one. So they were not enrolled during 2019-20, during so they do not qualify for the EO. Correct. So we don't know what they were doing. They need to work with their preliminary program to fix, finish the TPA. I guess they, if they've done everything but the TPA, I guess they do make sense for a PSVTW. That person could be a PSVTW, and then they would have one year to complete the TPA. Carrie, can you answer can you ask ask that, Terry? Oh, Carrie, hold on one more second. Go ahead, Amy. I think as we continue to, as I continue to think about that candidate, um, if they're, they weren't enrolled in 2019, 2020, mm -hmm. executive order doesn't work. Could you put them on a PSVTW if you felt program that this candidate really was ready to move forward, get a job and begin teaching? Right. Uh, that is your call. But if that happens, then they need to enroll with you because they need to be affiliated formally with your program and they need support to pass the TPA uh, under your guidance, not under the induction program, or it's a collaborative effort. We could say that, but the PSVTW candidate, remember, is the responsibility of the preparation program. Preliminary, excellent. Oh, Carrie. Sorry, Carrie, sorry I, don't, I don't have a question. I accidentally hit the raise hand and you kept nope. calling my name and I was like, is she calling me? And I'm so sorry. No problem, Carrie. We'll okay. go to someone else. Okay, thank you. North Coast School of Education, I've unmuted you. Hi, it's Kelly Daly, Terry. How are you doing? I'm doing fine. How are you? Good. Good. I want to thank you again for your graduation speech. Oh, I hope it went well. What happened? To, we just lost North Coast. Oh, heavens. Raise your hand again, and we'll call on you again in a minute. Jana from UC Davis, you can unmute yourself. Hi, um, my question is about the specialized form for the PSVTW. We were told a special form would come out after June 1, and I don't see it in the new directions. If you mean just the application form, it, it did come out on, on June 1st itself. It's um, on the forms. Um, section of the SIG website. So if you're just looking at the, the main CTC webpage, it's not on there, it's on the SIG. Okay, I'll find it on the SIG. That's what I wanted. Thank you. And Angel, do you want to do an oral um, advertisement for your session later this week? Sure. So there is another session, as Terry just mentioned, um, but it's going to be run by certifications. It's going to focus much more on like the credential analysts and it's going to handle much more questions about submission and that is on Thursday, and the time escapes me. I want to say 1.30. Double checking. Yeah, 1.30 to 2.30 on Thursday. And we did send a um, certain news blast earlier, and then we sent an update because the first one forgot to mention the date and time. So, you know, things happen. But, yes, it is this coming Thursday in just a few days. Maria, I've unmuted you. Hi, this is Maria from UC Davis. I just had a question. We have a few students who are going to be uh, recommended for their preliminary with um, either the RECA or the TPA. I just want to verify if there's any additional documents that I need to submit as part of their online recommendation. 
I read through the guidance documents and one of them referenced a letter, but I do remember during the last webinar, Erin had mentioned that no additional documents would be needed besides, you know, the, the, what we usually attach. So I just want clarification on the process, please. Yeah, for the, for the TPA, Enrica, no, no additional requirements, no additional letters are necessary. Please just add that renewal requirement on there. Um, I know exactly what you're referencing. There was a guidance document that did mention something about a letter. Um, we noticed that and realized we had a conflict there. It was just a, an unfortunate oversight. That document has been updated and corrected, so it no longer says that. But I just want to make it clear, nothing else is required for people taking advantage of those. Wonderful. Thank you. Christopher, I've unmuted you. Do you have a question for us? Hello, this is Chris. Hi, Chris. Um, when recommending for the intern credential, um, I know somebody had mentioned before about selecting uh, for subject matter, the, how it was met, but for the authorization codes, um, generally we select out of the exam list. Uh, should we still do that? Um, thinking that that's how they were going to pass or meet the, the specific authorization? Angel, join us. We need you. My, my video almost didn't un, uh, uncheck itself there. Uh, yeah, go ahead and do that because realistically, this is such a unique situation and these options are so odd. Like if you selected their authorization by exam, normally that would mean they took the exam. And if you selected it without that, normally that would mean they admitted through something else like subject matter competence. We know that neither of those is really true and there is no clean way to give someone one of those authorizations and still sort of say, oh, but they didn't need it yet because of this, that, and the other. So just go ahead and select it by the method that they, in theory, are hoping to pass it by. We understand that that's not entirely accurate, but that is just the situation we have. Thank you. Thanks, Angel. Uh, Kelly, you're back on at North Coast. Hi, um, just a quick question about data collection for the Ed TPA or any TPA really, um, once they go into induction, would induction then um, have to report out on those scores? Amy's been working with our contractor. Why don't you share the information, Amy? Yeah, so um, I'll just speak uh, for the Cal TPA, but everyone I'm sure is aware, and if you're not, that the technical contractor for both assessments is evaluation systems. So in times like this, it makes it very helpful because what we do on one assessment, of, you know, we know it could be done for the other. So we will get back to you on the exact details about how data will flow in the future here. We're hoping to be able to uh, revise our registration page for candidates so that they can tell us where they want their data sent. So for exams, uh, they've always been able to say, send it to multiple places. Well, now within the performance assessment world, uh, candidates should be able to tell us where their preliminary program is and their induction program. And we're working on how we can get data not only to the preliminary program, because it's still important data for pro preliminary programs to look at to see how they're doing, how they're functioning. Uh, and then also for induction programs now who are joining this effort, you will need to know uh, who you can recommend for a clear credential. So, um, you will need to have access to that data. Now, right now, the one who has the data is the candidate. So the candidate can bring the data with them. It should be written on their IDP as well that they have, for example, in the Cal TPA, perhaps they still have cycle two to complete. They've already finished and passed cycle one. Whatever their individual story is, it should be on that IDP. And that would be true for the NTPA if they uh, for example, let's say they move through the Ed TPA, they finished the five tasks, they submitted, it, it came back, they still have room to grow, they didn't pass. Uh, that kind of information should be on the IDP and should come into the program, into the induction program. Uh, so right now the candidate has the data, of course we have the data, and right now preliminary programs have the data. What we need to do is open it up so that induction programs can get access. So we're working on that and we will let you know. Thank you. Lisa, I've unmuted you, if you'd like to unmute yourself and share your question. Lisa, we're not hearing you. Go 
Christina, I've given you the ability to unmute yourself to ask your, your question. Margie, can you unmute yourself and ask your question? Yes, so the question, I also posed it in the Q&A. The question again comes back to Rika for a student who was not enrolled in the 2019-2020 year. I understand they do not, uh, they aren't eligible for uh, EON 6620. If they haven't yet passed Rika, can they still be recommended for the preliminary credential? So the enrollment in the 1920 year does not apply to RECA. The enrollment in 1920 only applies to the TPA. When you look, download the flowchart we've developed, it's gonna show you that an individual who has, was not enrolled in 2019-20, but can show their preliminary program that they attempted to take the RECA and they were not able to due to COVID, that person who has completed all requirements may be recommended for the preliminary with the RECA renewal code. Enrollment has nothing to do with the RECA assessment. The enrollment provision is only for TPA. Thank you. Lisa, are you able to share a question with us? Mary Ann, can you unmute and share your question? Yeah, I can, thank you. My question is about the CSET deferral. We have a few students who started our program without pass the CSETs and got stopped at the student teaching point. So they were applicants more than a year ago. Is there any way the CSET deferral would apply to them? If they have to reapply to the program to restart the program, would it then apply to them? If they're applying for the 2021 year, it applies to them. Okay. You have to determine if they're applying or not. Okay. So only if they reapply, not if they're just picking, they can't just pick things back up if they're mid process. The EO says they're applicants for the 2021 year. Great. Thank you so much. Jessica. Hi, so mine is actually kind of similar to Mary Ann's. Our program admits for both fall and spring. So for our candidates that are applying to the program for spring 2021, I'm assuming because of what you just told Mary Ann that the CBEST and the CSET deferrals would apply to them as well. They're applying for spring, spring 21. 21. We admit in fall and spring. So everything that's being shared now is definitely applicable to your fall admission. Mm -hmm. It is unclear if it's applicable to your spring 21 admission. We are going to have to do some more research on that. Okay. Thank you. Lisa or Christina, are you able to answer, to ask your question yet? Katrine, join us. Do you have a question? Yeah, just so, just so I'm clear, we have, we have some interns in our district who have, have, taken and failed the RECA in the past. Um, and since the enrollment year doesn't apply to them, if they, uh, do they have to demonstrate that they attempted to take it during the COVID blackout window in order to um, qualify for issue of a preliminary credential by their programs? This is RECA only, you said, right? Yes, just RECA. Like Rika has they, nothing. They Rika has failed, Harry. like they took it and failed, and then they were trying to retake it, but they couldn't retake it. Does it still that, apply to them? That would apply if they attempted to take it okay. but were not able to take it. Yes. Cool. And I also just want to say that even if we just have one person in our induction programs who needs TPA support, that's going to go a long way to bridging those levels of preparation. And we're going to learn a lot about how to pick people up from where they came. So, I mean, it's silver lining, you know, what can I say? Thank you. Thank you, Katrine. Elizabeth, do you have a question you'd like to ask us? Uh, yes. Thank you. 
There you go. Can you hear me okay? Yes, we can. Okay. So for Title II reporting in the past, when someone had not completed like EdTPA, we would report them as not a completer. But now we are recommending them for a preliminary credential without the like EdTPA. So do we mark them on our Title II report as a completer now? We are going to be figuring that out and getting back to you as soon as possible. We okay. don't know yet. All righty. Thank you. Okay, we're getting close to the end of time. Daryl, do you have a question for us? Uh, yes, and I'm sorry if you've uh, answered this, but students who have been working on RECA um, and would fall within the um, opportunity to receive their preliminary credential, but they also have not finished TPA and they weren't enrolled in 1920. So which takes precedent? The 1920 non-TPA person that have to go on a PS uh, VTW or the RECA, I get my preliminary credential uh, route. The only time the EO can be used if only that requirement is what is left. So since that person has TPA and something else, that person is not a TPA eligible if they were not enrolled. So the RECA is not eligible either because they have not passed everything but RECA. So th they are in some trouble. The PSVTW is probably their only option. Great, thank you very much. Okay, last time for Lisa. Last time for Christina. I have two more hands up and I'll try both of those and then we're gonna end. So um, Nenit from Nenit Wills. Hello. Okay, um, I know this is, you've been talking about TPAs for a while, so I'll try to um, ask this. So we have transitioned from TPA tasks to um, cycles. We had a yes. deadline for our candidates to pass TPA tasks um, this month, but we have several candidates who either never submitted or still have a couple of tasks that they haven't passed. Well, we will not have um, the assessors any longer starting June 1st, or I'm sorry, starting July 1st. So when we apply for their credential, we would like to tell them they now have to do the cycles because we have no way to assess any of their tasks if they submit them anytime now. And I don't believe the induction programs would be able to support them. No. Okay. No. Um, very good point. Then could you email into, go ahead and send it to my email and I will bring it in with a multiple single subject people to work with you because you're right. Um, the induction programs are only going to work with people in Cal TPA 2.0 with the cycles or ed TPA. Okay. Jeannie. Thank you. Bye-bye. Jeannie McHatton, last question for the day. Yes. Hi, um, Terry and Amy. Okay, Terry, I'm going back to your response from at 220. that talks about a student teacher who okay. hasn't completed the TPAs but does not get hired by a district. Then who does that person fall under? No, they go back to their college prep program? Their preliminary program, because they don't have a job, they're not an induction. Right, and I just wanna build on that a little bit. Remember, you can't just walk into schools as an independent agent and do a TPA. Um, you have to be affiliated with a teacher preparation program because there's issues of liability and agreements, MOUs between that school district, that school, you, the preparation program or they are employed and then are covered by the district and are part of an induction program as soon as possible. So there is no middle ground there. They would need to come back to you or if they've met all these different requirements, then they can move forward, but they can't independently decide to do something. So then the college would have to somehow provide some kind of placement for them to get the, the TPAs done. Completed. That's correct, because there's, yes. you, know, you can't have someone out there working with kids if they're not part of a supported program, uh, do, you know, just for a long list of reasons. But yes, we would not want to do that.
mostly liability. Okay, thank you. So we are past our three o'clock time and I went with the last few hands that were up. If you still have a question, please feel free to contact us. We hope this information has been helpful to you today. And who knows, we may be back here in a couple more weeks. You, you just never know. Thank you for joining us, everyone. Bye.